now that we have all systems active, let me uh, welcome you here today on behalf of the Global Law Labs and the IHILP lectures for Dr. Marco Duranti from the University of Sydney. He is going to present his research on the history of international human rights law. And uh, he has very recently published a book in February 2017 on conservative origins of human rights. So, Marco, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Inga, for inviting me to be here at this forum. I'm, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm really happy to be uh, talking to a group of legal scholars who are interested in, uh, in a historical perspective on, on your subject. Um, I should just preface this by saying I, I was trained as a historian. I did my BA in history, my PhD in history. Um, so I've spent most of my life in the historian's guild. Um, and in a way, I think the innovation of my work is that uh, I apply mainstream historical tools and perspectives uh, to the history of international law, uh, and more particularly the origins of the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, as, as I understand it, um, the paper I wrote was circulated to you, and that is uh, drawn from different parts of the book I published. This is my self-serving book slide. Um, as, as, uh, there, having been in Australia for seven years now, I know that uh, Americans are sometimes understood to be a bit um, pushy and self-promoting, so I thought I would conform to the stereotype by, by advertising my book very prominently. Um, so I so th the book I've just published, The Conservative Human Rights Revolution, <coughs> is on the origins of the European human rights system. In effect, it is a cultural, intellectual, and political history of the birth of European human rights law. So uh, mm -hmm. the book is aimed primarily at historians, but I took a bit of a risk, especially for a first book, and I framed the introduction and some of the chapters and, and the conclusion and epilogue of the book for international lawyers. And it was only kind of in the later stages of my book that I started to understand some of the implications of this history of the origins for the present. And both for controversies surrounding the European Court of Human Rights uh, of late, um, particularly in Britain, but not necessarily so, for uh, the kind of legal reasonings and legal principles that the court um, uses and the question of original intent behind the European Convention, but also for controversy surrounding the European Union. So the book is a history of international human rights law, but it's also a history of the European project writ large. And I say a history of the European project instead of European integration because the protagonists of my book, who are these conservatives, including Winston Churchill there, who played a very important role in the invention of the European Court of Human Rights, were envisioning their human rights projects as part of a larger project for the unification of Europe or Western Europe. And this was not just about the economic unification of Europe. It was not just about a kind of common market or a common currency, but it was also about the cultural and ethical unification of Europe. So the book is as much about the birth of European human rights law as it is about the cultural and ethical foundations of the European project, about how these conservatives envisioned human rights and international justice as the foundation stone of a united Europe, how they tried to construct a vision of international law around a consensus about certain fundamental European values. And among these values are human rights and democracy. Now, these terms are human rights and democracy as understood by these conservatives. Um, so the book tries to appeal to different constituencies. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit at the end of this talk about some of the issues involved in doing interdisciplinary work and, and uh, having a kind of cross-pollination of, of history and law. Uh, so the book is written for different constituencies, historians and international lawyers, but also within the field of history, I try to not only appeal to people who are working very narrowly on international human rights, but try to show other historians, which are 99% of the historical profession, why the history of human rights and international law might have relevance to their own work. 
So not only historians of the European project, and the history of the European project is fairly marginal to the historical discipline, but people who are doing national history. So people who do the history of Britain, for example, the history of France, the history of Western Europe, people who are interested in the history of conservatism uh, more generally. So the book itself, I should just add one more note, it spans uh, the first half of the 20th century. So even though the focus of the book is on the years immediately after the, the Second World War, uh, 1946 to 1950 is this period of what I call the conservative human rights revolution, a revolution led by conservatives in the structures of international law uh, and international institutions in Europe, uh, I also argue for deeper continuities uh, that begin with the Hague Peace Conferences in 1899, uh, and the construction of the Peace Palace of The Hague, which, as you know, is the seat of the International Court of Justice, uh, going through different forms of internationalism in the interwar period, and finally looking in the aftermath of the Second World War. So, uh, I, as I argued in the paper that I circulated, uh, when we address this question of continuities and ruptures, right? Continuities and discontinuities is a kind of obsession of historians, and it's not always obvious to non-historians why we care so much about continuities and ruptures. And I think that's something we have to show why it's relevant. But when we think of this issue of periodization, when did the when did the history of human rights begin? Okay, or or the, you know that we have to think not only of form but also of content. So I use this dualism of form and content, but in other words the language may change. The moral and political languages that certain kinds of historical actors may change. All of a sudden, people might use this phrase human rights in English, or they may use droit de l'homme, uh, or diritti de uomo uh, in, in romance languages. They may talk about universal rights, or equal rights and alienable rights, uh, in a way they hadn't before, maybe. Uh, they may advocate all of a sudden new technical structures, new innovations in international law. They may talk about new kinds of international courts, talk about supranational justice. That's a phrase some of these conservatives use. So the linguistic forms and the technical forms change in the, after the Second World War. But what I also argue in my book is though the form changes, sometimes the content remains the same. In other words, uh, if you look at the meaning of human rights and you look at the contents of the European Convention on Human Rights, the kinds of rights that are protected, the kinds of rights that are not protected, the institutional structures that are created, above all, this extraordinary European court, uh, in many ways reflects a, a larger, deeper conservative world worldview, but also reflects a new way in which conservatives are trying to pursue older conservative policies. So uh, part of the book is about the kind of cultural and ethical and intellectual dimensions of conservatism above, above all their, their, their Christian view of Europe, their understanding of human rights, uh, not as necessarily a recent liberal invention, but as uh, the values of an older Christian Europe, an older Christian humanist civilization. Their understanding of human rights, not necessarily uh, in the way it's articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but human rights is grounded in the particular history and values uh, of Europeans. And the other part of the book looks at domestic politics and looks at how what I call free market conservatives and social conservatives uh, uh, pursued a kind of conservative agenda through the vehicle of international human rights law. And I say that not, not necessarily in a cynical way. It's not necessarily that these conservatives were uh, cynical in their approach to human rights. I think they genuinely uh, understood the defense of human rights as the defense of property and uh, landowners and church schools and uh, people they thought who were conservative, conservatives who had been unfairly uh, imprisoned or accused after the war of various crimes, uh, they, they saw themselves uh, after the Second World War as a kind of endangered minority because in Britain and France from 1945 to 1951, conservatives are in the minority in the parliament in those countries. So conservatives feared for their liberties at the hands of these left-wing majorities during this period. Um, so that's that, in a way, is the, the structure I'm looking at. I just want to give that kind of prefatory remark. Um, and because I also think when I'm talking about some more abstract ideas in the slides that follow, it's always a good idea to kind of for, to have a sense of how they're tethered to some kind of actual uh, case that I'm, that I'm looking at. And, and I it's, this is a history of Western Europe, but it, I also try to keep in, to, in mind the imperial dimension of the story, the transatlantic dimension of the story, uh, and try to give a little bit of a sense of how this 
kind of Western European project compares with what's going on at the United Nations and, and in other places. Okay. So one, and here in a bit, in a bit of a way, I'm, I'm giving um, a presentation and a story in many respects that I have thought about after publishing the book. So uh, I have a very naive, I should say, I have a very naive version of how, of how I came about to do my project, which is I was in the archives and I, and I kind of stumbled across these documents a few months into working on another project. These, these interesting conservative intellectuals were presenting a report on, on human rights. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is kind of unusual. And then I started to follow up and I started to get really interested in the origins of this court. And I kind of went where the sources led me. So I was actually trained in Italian and German history, ended up doing a lot of British and French history, never thought I was going to work on international law or human rights, kind of ended up uh, doing this work. So that's my narrative. It's a very historian's kind of inductive narrative, especially in the English speaking world. We tend to have these, this kind of narrative that we just kind of follow our sources and, and go from there. Um, but so, so I didn't set out in my, in my work to have, you know, w with some kind of paradigm in mind of my approach or any, any necessarily sense uh, that I was going to be kind of going after, you know, go, trying to kind of change the existing paradigms in various disciplines and fields of history. Um, again, I think that's th this kind of story that we tell ourselves as historians is, is one that I believe, but is also a very common genre of, of, of story that we that we do. So what I'm presenting here in a way about the methodological innovations that I've thought about and the way I think uh, the field needs to progress is something that is a kind of retrospective uh, kind of orientation. Okay, so I should just say, so histories of international law, uh, let me just get these different ones here, they, they tend to be uh, histories of international lawyers, histories of great thinkers, or uh, histories of, of statesmen because they usually tend to be men. Uh, so, you know, of course, uh, they could be a history of ideas approach. That's often the case if you look at uh, histories of international law or the law of nations before the 19th century, right? A history of the ideas of Grotius or the ideas of Vattel. Uh, you might go earlier, maybe perhaps, to medieval thinkers. You might go back to ancient times. Of course, there's a lot of new work on the non-Western uh, origins of international law, not only looking at the kind of reception of international law outside of the West, but also how uh, international legal norms are generated from outside of the West. But it tends to be this kind of uh, a kind of history of ideas in a very traditional sense, uh, and and especially in the kind of late 19th century and 20th century, when you have a scientific kind of profession of international law emerge, the histories tend to be, you know, histories of publications of international lawyers, and of course. Uh, this makes sense given that most of the people who have worked on the history of international law have been trained as lawyers and have a very, you know, fine-tuned sense of kind of the legal principles at work and a very and an interest in kind of looking at the genealogy of certain kinds of legal uh, principles and norms and forms of legal reasoning. Uh, and also the fact that international lawyers, you know, uh, often tend to work at kind of the nexus, the intersection of of legal scholarship and uh, you know government policy. So uh, you know if if this is I mean I'm thinking of a new book that has just come out um, called The Internationalists, um, uh, which uh, um, Una Hathaway has uh, authored and and uh, with her colleague uh, Shapiro on um, the Kellogg Briand Pact uh, in the interwar period, and and her focus is on sure enough it's on lawyers and it's on these kind of um, it's on American lawyers and these American kind of statesmen, people in the State Department or foreign ministry. You know, she herself is a, is at Yale Law School and has worked for the U.S. State Department. So that that's a kind of natural intersection at work, and it kind of makes sense that these histories of international law would kind of follow follow that that route. And of course, there's been very very fruitful uh, work. You know, the, the the kind of work that's always cited uh, as a kind of very seminal piece of work in this is Marty Kuskinyemi's Gentle Civilizer of Nations, right? Where that's basically the approach. Martin Kuskinyemi kind of reads everything about, you know, written as much as he can and uh, that's been published in kind of international law in Germany and France uh, and Britain and elsewhere and, and, and writes a history of that with the, with uh, kind of the empire and other, and other factors in mind. But I, I think, you know, the, the way that when historians, by the way, people train in history have started to you know do it and they, they often tend to kind of do the same thing. People interested in the history of international law tend to be trained as intellectual historians. So 
what I kind of I've tried to do in my book and, and propose as a future line of research and has been done in some recent historical work is to have a history of international law beyond the history of international lawyers or kind of beyond the history of statement to expand the range of historical actors. So not just lawyers and government officials and philosophers, but civil society groups, journalists, politicians, uh, publicists, artists, even poets and architects. And I think this is also kind of where the cultural history comes in. If you want to understand international norms, I think you have to understand that norms, values, are something that transcend, of course, legal treatises. They transcend kind of political manifestos and they're part of kind of the cultural artifact and, and environment around us. That's, after all, what gives us our kind of sensibility, uh, right, about the world and the kind of ethics that unite us. So the history of international law, um, again, I think has to be more than a traditional history of ideas or legal history or diplomatic history. And there's a need to reintegrate this history into what I call mainstream cultural, intellectual, and political history. And when I say mainstream, I don't mean necessarily cultural history with the cultural turn. In other words, not necessarily that you have to be using kind of critical theory and cultural theory, but pretty much the kind of empirical way people do these kinds of history. Uh, in political history, an interest in political institutions and parties, uh, interest in political culture, uh, cultural history and attention to certain kinds of symbolism. It could be cultural symbolism, religious symbolism, and artifacts. Uh, and the history of intellectuals, not only great thinkers, but also the history of uh, intellectuals who are more, uh, who are perhaps second tier or third tier thinkers are more involved in journalism and activism uh, and so forth, but nonetheless had an important role to play. So uh, I also think, you know, what is the value added of historians? What is our basic kind of, what do we, what do, we do in the university and maybe in the world writ large, um, other than just kind of tell true stories, supposedly? Um, so I mean, one is we, we add context to text, right? So we read, uh, we read, when we read text, whether it's reading a, the European Convention on Human Rights or Universal Declaration of Human Rights or reading transcripts of negotiations or reading a, a book written on international law, uh, whatever the source may be, we try to read that source in the light of the vari of various contexts in which we embed that source, whether it be the political, intellectual, cultural, social, what have you. So uh, it, every historian is, you know, has to kind of figure out what those contexts are uh, and what I would just argue, I, I think, uh, as an important principle that I think historians also have to keep in mind is the importance of approaching these histories from a tangent. In other words, not always thinking about it directly, because I think the most interesting and innovative insights come from placing that source in a less obvious kind of context that you might not particularly expect. I mean, also, of course, the, the function of historians is also kind of the memory function of, of humanity in a way, or, or whatever a community we're, we're in. And in a way, our function is also kind of to recover, I think, forgotten aspects of the past and kind of give voice to forgotten actors, but also hopefully to step back and kind of evaluate what's going on as well. So, um, right. So, uh, Again, a wider range of context, a wider range of sources, so not just the kind of travaux preparatoire that uh, are often used by international lawyers, right, the official publications of the Council of Europe, um, but also uh, looking at the back, what, I, what you might call the backstage activity, right, behind the scenes. That's often another value added of history. You look at the, the government archives, the diplomatic, right, behind the scenes, but also personal papers of particular individuals involved a particular movement, uh, but also, for example, historical newspapers. And this, I, I think, it's very important to look at, to kind of go in depth into particular spaces and particular moments. So in my book, I look very closely at the Hague Peace Conferences, but also uh, particular spaces like the Peace Palace of the Hague, in which you have all this variety of different kinds of art and artifacts and objects and architecture that are supposed to represent and symbolize the palace itself, the, the kind of underlying principles of international justice and the kind of nations that unite them. Um, so, uh, but in addition to looking at events very, very carefully. So when I, I the, the main protagonists of my book are part of these movements for European unity. These are what we would call today international non-governmental organizations. 
But these are movements that come up after the Second World War, before governments get interested in European integration, before governments get interested in any kind of European Convention on Human Rights. These movements come and they meet together in particular events, often with a lot of publicity. You know, at the Congress of Europe in May 1948, there are 800 journalists in attendance. It's a kind of meeting of these celebrities politicians and intellectuals and activists and others who come to imagine a Europe, but to look very, very closely using historical newspapers, uh, using the kind of behind the scenes uh, sources that you have as well. Maybe what you might call a kind of micro history. So to look at spaces, not just networks of lawyers and politicians and, and others, but actually a space in which are transnational, which people from different countries come together from different uh, professions, they have different dispositions. And it's interesting what happens in these spaces when you have people from different national contexts coming together and trying to kind of uh, you know, discuss and debate and agree on a certain kind of international legal text and human rights texts. Uh, and that, those dynamics are quite interesting. And in those spaces, you often have opportuni political opportunities that you don't have necessarily back at home. So conservatives, for example, who at home in Britain or France are in the minority, often on the defensive, within these spaces may have uh, other kinds of opportunities. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so let's get a little bit of the overview of uh, kind of the development of this new history of human rights. Now that I've kind of given you my kind of methodological insights. So before historians, uh, became interested in the history, I should say, of international human rights. And I use that word international human rights uh, because I, I, I want to talk in a moment about what the boundaries of human rights and the history of human rights are. There had been, um, you know, the, the kind of new history of human rights really begins in 2010 with uh, the publication of Samuel Moyne's Last Utopia. But before that, we have a number of international relations scholars, political scientists, such as uh, Margaret Keck and Catherine Sicking, who are part of the constructivist school of international relations, people who stress not just the pursuit of state interests, but non-state actors and transnational activism and transnational norms, who look, for example, at humanitarianism and transnational advocacy from anti-slavery movements uh, up until kind of Amnesty International and the present day. You had people like Daniel Thomas, who was also part of this constructivist school of international relations, who is, uh, uh, is someone who is also interested in this notion of transnational identity and transnational norms. And he looks at the origins of the Helsinki Accords, the 1975 Helsinki Accords uh, between the communist and non-communist states, which gave rise to Helsinki Watch, which later became Human Rights uh, Watch. It was an important tool for dissidents within communist states to argue for uh, greater protections of human rights. Um, right, you have Andrew Moravchik who wrote a, an article on the, my subject, The Origins of the European Convention on Human Rights, who pursued another paradigm, a kind of liberal institutionalist paradigm. And he argued that the, on the basis of reading the official publications of the Council of Europe, he said, well, in effect, transnational movements and norms had nothing to do with this story. Uh, it was basically what, what really mattered was whether a particular government had been uh, under kind of German axis occupation or not, basically. That's what, that determined their position. You also had philosophers. Uh, I mean, one I'm going to cite in particular, Johannes Morsink wrote a book on kind of the original intent behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Again, he read all the official kind of UN transcripts and came up with some ideas behind the different articles and who was involved and what the intent might have been. Uh, you have legal scholars um, like Marianne Glendon, Brian Simpson. Marianne Glendon writes a book on the, the origins of the Universal Declaration through the perspective of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the chair of the, of the UN Human Rights Commission, the, who had been uh, married to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a kind of American progressive. Uh, Brian Simpson is very important. He writes a, a book, kind of the predecessor to mine, on the European Convention on Human Rights uh, using a great deal of archival research, probably the first book really to do very in-depth archival uh, research in the British government archives. He very much has the perspective, of course, of the British government officials on this story. You also have some literary scholars, for example, Lynn Festa looking at anti-slavery movements, looking very carefully at the kind of rhetoric used by British, in particular Quaker and kind of Christian anti-slavery activists. And she distinguishes between kind of anti-slavery human rights and 
uh, humanitarianism and, and a kind of understanding of human rights is actually empowering kind of uh, uh, people. Okay. Um, now, the, the historians of human rights, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, so this new history of human rights, and I should say my own work on the history of human rights began uh, well before 2010 and Samuel Morn, uh, again, uh, I didn't have any intention necessarily of working on this subject, but uh, Samuel Moyne, uh, who wrote The Last Utopia uh, in 2010, a critical history of human rights. He, he was on my uh, committee in the end. We met and, and, you know, he's been an influence on me and hopefully I've had some influence in a more minor way on him. Um, but I should say there's, there was a revival uh, in the early 2000s and kind of late 90s of international history. So it had once been called diplomatic history, but that was considered old fashioned. Um, it should be noted, by the way, that in the and here, you know, national context matters in terms of when you're talking about history. But particularly in the English-speaking world, cultural history had had ascended uh, in the 80s and particularly the 90s. So by the end of the 90s, uh, cultural history becomes the, the the establishment history in in the profession, right? And cultural historians, as, as usually happens when a new paradigm is developing, uh, they argue that their work is incommensurable with everybody else's, and kind of everybody else does very boring, old-fashioned history. Okay, so. Uh, as the cult, my interpretation is as cultural historians kind of, once they achieve this kind of hegemonic presence, um, they become kind of more comfortable. Uh, they, they allow kind of other fields, disciplines to kind of come back, other subfields to kind of come back into the fold, uh, especially if they pay more attention to issues that the cultural historians are interested in, take into account also empire and race and gender, hopefully, and, and uh, these kinds of aspects. And cultural historians in turn began to become interested in politics and ec economics and things. So there's this revival of international history, an a revival of an interest in origins, because with the rise of cultural history, particularly uh, those influenced by Foucault, but more generally, an interest in kind of representations, you know, symbolism. Uh, there, was a, there was a move on the part of cultural historians to abandon this idea of origins and abandon a focus on causality, in part, I think, of an insecurity on their part that they weren't always able to show directly causation from the kind of culture they were interested in to the larger world. I mean, obviously, I think Hopefully, we can all agree the cultural context and the culture in the, it, around us and the way I mean, inside of us matters, but that's not always obvious. Uh, and there were a lot of critiques of the idea of origins in general, um, but now there's been a re rekindling of interest in kind of origins. Uh, in addition, um, there is this historical turn in international law and a lot of uh, critical scholarship on international law and human rights more generally, not just in the field of law, but in a lot of other disciplines, social sciences, humanities, other disciplines. So this new history of human rights, um, you know, that emerges, which, I mean, th th not all, this new history is not all uh, derivative of Samuel Moyne. People have been, started writing these histories before Samuel Moyne, but in The Last Utopia, Samuel Moyne uh, puts forward a number of controversial arguments. They're actually in many ways better received outside of the historical discipline than, than within it in some respects. But he says, for example, the, the way we understand and practice human rights today um, the, the way we think of human rights as above the state or beyond the state, uh, the, the, um, in particular, uh, that only really started in the 1970s. And before that, we don't really see it. That's what he says. And he's particularly interested kind of in a US perspective. He, he's someone who was trained as a historian and a lawyer. So he's also interested in when human rights really become something uh, in international law, that, that the international lawyers really become interested in human rights. It becomes binding. Uh, he's interested in kind of transnational human rights. So Amnesty International in 1977 gets the Nobel Peace Prize uh, and has these very public kind of anti-torture campaigns and letter writing campaigns. 1977 is also when the US President Jimmy Carter in his inaugural address after being elected, he talks about the promotion of human rights kind of, uh, and this is something that Barbara Keyes, uh, an Australian historian of the US talks a lot about. She looks at US foreign policy after Vietnam and looks at Kind of both the Demo Jimmy Carter and this and, and his idea of human rights foreign policy, but also neoconservatism as it developed in the 70s as well. Sarah Snyder is interested in the Helsinki Accords and Helsinki Watch, so both this kind of treaty, but more importantly, these transnational organizations that developed after after the Helsinki Accords. Um, and Laura Wildenthal, historian of Germany, looks very carefully at the way in which the language of human rights was used within West German uh, domestic politics. Uh, and looking often at the conflicting ways in which that was used. Um, 
these are kind of more Western perspectives, and I would put mine in that group as well, but there's also kind of the non-Western perspectives, but a lot of people working on colonialism and anti-colonialism. So Samuel Moyne argues that anti-colonialism was not a human rights movement. He also says the French Revolution was not a human rights uh, revolution. Because for Samuel Moyne, in a way, kind of, I think, implicitly echoing some conservative historians, but though he doesn't think of himself as a conservative, he says left-wing nationalism is basically not a human rights movement. They may talk about the rights of man, the rights of people, the rights, the rights of the people, the rights of the nation, but in the end, they're not a human rights movement because in the end, it's all, all the rights are within the framework of the state. Uh, in practice, there's no re the, all these rights kind of declarations and texts don't really have any positive uh, legal value. They're not above the state. Um, you have, so Roland Burke kind of, in a way, offers a bit of a different perspective, saying anti-colonialism at first kind of embraces human rights and not necessarily later. He talks about the relationship between self-determination and human rights. Bonnie Ibowo uh, looks at African perspectives and understandings of human rights and duties. Fabian Closa looks at the Algerian War of Independence. Uh, Stephen Jensen has made an argument that in the 1960s, it really was uh, the, that new international human rights norms were really generated outside of the West. Um, also in newly independent countries, Meredith Toretta has looked at uh, the UN trusteeship, so at the United Nations, it wasn't just the Human Rights Commission, there was also, like at the League of Nations before it, there was um, a, a committee that, a com that was responsible for looking at kind of petitions from certain colonies and the respect of human rights in the colonies. And there are a lot of short, these are kind of people who wrote these, these books, but they're, and we as historians are really, really like books. Um, <laughs> but uh, but there's also a lot of shorter pieces, a lot of them on kind of drafting of particular texts, uh, a lot of them in a way much like Marianne Glendon and Johannes Morsink from the previous slide, trying to show the universality of human rights. So the human rights have a lot of divergent points of origin and are kind of universally shared values, particularly uh, those writing on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights who've tried to look at a lot of the different delegations, uh, not just the Europeans and Americans, but the Latin Americans uh, Asian delegations, you know, India, the Indian delegation, the Chinese, uh, uh, Lebanese, and so forth. Okay. Now, um, all right. So then again, we should ask ourselves though, what is exactly the history of human rights, and what are the boundaries of the history of human rights? Do you need those words "human rights" to appear in your work in order to be writing the history of human rights and the history of international human rights norms? Um, now, first of all, it should be noted that human rights is an English language expression. Okay, I mean, you have mention of ECTA in German, uh, right? You, you can have other equivalents of this, uh, but it, 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 that, that phrase itself is an English language expression. And that's important because Samuel Moyne is very concerned with how often this phrase is used. So he looks at the New York Times and he says, well, it's not until the 70s that this phrase is really used very much, human rights. But again, it's important to note, well, that's in the English speaking context, of course, the, the French and others are using droit de l'homme. They're using the same language of rights and mention elected that they had used for a very long time, way before the words human rights were inserted into the, the Charter of the United Nations, way before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example. So it's important to pay attention to kind of the, the, these, these differences in the historical resonance, right? I mean, to this day, the French prefer droit de l'homme, rights of man, to human rights. They've resisted saying human rights because the rights of man for them, the human rights and the, are the rights of man. They come from the French revolutionary tradition in the 1789 Declaration of uh, the Rights of Man. So uh, I think language is important. Now, some people, French might say the rights of the human person, the rights of the person. The rights of the person, for example, is a very... You, kind of ecumenical phrase that the person is a category that's shared by a lot of different kind of legal systems and and and, and uh, different kinds of religious and philosophical understandings of kind of rights and duties the person uh, as you probably know is an old legal category from Rome it's in canon law in the Middle Ages and the, the and then also in common law uh, so you know so the, the person can have a lot of different meanings uh, and that word personal rights can have a lot of different meanings some historians have said well the reason why uh, the person is included in the Universal Declaration is a very, it's a Christian project, that the, the person has, is part of this Catholic or Christian thought, uh, and that, that shows kind of the influence of Christianity. But that word, the person, like the word human rights and rights and liberties, is a kind of abstract word that can take on a lot of different meanings for different people, and that's kind of the point, because the way you come up with a consensus, the way you agree on uh, a certain kind of text is by often using language that is kind of has a kind of ambiguous meaning that everyone can agree on in theory, but in practice they have 
a different understanding. So again, what are the boundaries of this field of the history of human rights? And um, you know, I, I think we should think more expansively. I don't, I don't think the history of human rights maybe is everything, but it's interesting what happens when you combine the word human with the word rights, and what are different conceptions of the human, different conceptions of rights, or more generally different understandings of the kind of communities uh, that in which that, that are going to be enjoying these rights equally and universally, and where these rights uh, derive from, and how they relate to other kinds of moral and political and legal languages. So, uh, what other kind of fields? You know, long before this new history of human rights, you had the historic <coughs> histories of ideas of fundamental rights and rights texts. So you could have people, in, in, intellectual historians, writing on, uh, you know, debates about wh wh when do you when do you have an understanding of subjective rights that emerge? When do you have an understanding of rights, uh, an individual as possessing rights and exercising rights, as opposed to just the kind of what is right? You know, these general norms. It is in the Middle Ages, ancient Rome. Does it come up with? Uh, Grotius, or or when does that happen? Right, certain rights texts. There's a lot of people who are kind of you know interested in say the Magna Carta, for example, and other kind of rights texts. Also, a lot of myths around that as well, uh, of of you know kind of what what these rights texts meant in at the time of their origin is not always the way in which these rights texts were understood later. There's histories of revolutions. I mean, his, you know what you know the great the, the most you know the the probably greatest mass of history in the Western world has been on you know, the origins of wars and wars and the origins of revolutions and revolutions. So the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution, of course, being the most prominent example, the 1848 revolutions, the Latin American revolutions, in China the revolutions, right? We can go on and on and on and on. Domestic rights activism, the history of kind of progressive rights movements, the civil rights movement in the United States, the 19th century kind of progressive movements for greater civil liberties and the rights of women, the rights of minorities. Uh, histories of humanitarian crises, maybe famines uh, or humanitarian abuses like slavery, but also the history of humanitarian movements like anti-slavery, the history of missionaries, for example. Uh, histories of wars and histories of pacifism. I mean, the history of human rights could also include the history of the abuse of human rights, too. Uh, or larger understandings of what it means to suffer humiliation and have your dignity uh, in, in, infringed upon and, and, and histories of suffering and understandings of suffering and how these manifest differently. Histories of pacifism, uh, histories of genocide uh, and, and responses to genocide. And then I also think you know that, that the, the history of international law, international human rights law is not just about international institutions. It's not even just about transnational movements. It's not just about states. It's not just about international NGOs. Uh, it's not just about foreign policy. It's, it's embedded within a lot of other contexts. So nationalism is the first form of internationalism. So when people, you know, with the French Revolution, uh, nationalism is about the, the nation is the people. So the, the whole basis of the French Revolution is that the, the political legitimacy is based on respecting uh, the natural rights of men and, and, that, and, and, and respecting the will of the people as expressed through the National Assembly, as expressed through parliaments. And, and, but this is not just something that the French revolutionaries saw as confined to France. They saw, they envisioned a kind of fraternity uh, of, of different nations, of different people who had freed themselves from tyrants and despots, who had freed themselves from foreign rulers, who had established new kind of liberal constitutional orders. Uh, and that they saw what they were doing as they, they could be exported into other countries. Okay. So nationalism, whether it's revolutionary in Europe or Latin America, or whether it's socialist or whether it's anti-colonial, is internationalist, okay, and has a lot of rights context. I mean, imperialism is an important part of the story as well, and you can see this uh, more or less cynically. I think we should always be cynical with respect to a lot of, of the, the ideologies of imperialism, but the ideology of imperialism, especially by the late 19th century, was often cast in a humanitarian way. It was about promoting, for the British, say, liberty and tolerance and minority rights in the empire, or for the French, about promoting the rights of man. Uh, okay, so it's important to keep you know, in mind that there could be a lot of ways of thinking about human rights and international human rights beyond just the history of the League of Nations or the Hague Peace Conferences or the Permanent Court of International Justice or Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, or the foreign policies uh, of you know, various kind of governments or different kinds of international texts and organizations. So um, I would also like to argue uh, here that these new critical histories of human rights, um, they make uh, a number of errors in a way that 
uh, in, a, in a sense, make them just as reductionist, as kind of simplistic as the more traditional narratives they criticize. So a lot of the critical history of human rights uh, criticizes what they see as a naive understanding of the history of human rights in which, which human rights have this very deep history, which human rights can begin in ancient Persia, or it can begin uh, perhaps uh, right with with the you know the natural rights thinkers or with the American and French revolutions, whatever it is, I could begin in ancient China. The the critical historians say no 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 no. What you're what you're doing wrong is you're you're just you're just saying every, that human rights can be found everywhere across time, and what you're not really doing is properly distinguishing the way we think of human rights today and the way it's practiced before. You're not what the critical historians say is you're not particularly looking at the particular context, the particular factors, the kind of contingent ways in which human rights are constructed. Uh, and that these, these, uh, the traditional histories of human rights are naive, they're idealistic, they don't properly understand the different kinds of interests involved and the kind of complexity and different kinds of factors involved. But what the critical historians uh, do themselves is they often essentialize the meaning of human rights. They distinguish between kind of authentic or genuine human rights and what they consider not to be the authentic um, human rights. And, and uh, I think in, in, in doing and in kind of arguing then, there are these sharp distinctions. Uh, what they do themselves is adopt a kind of essentialist approach. They give a kind of single meaning to human rights when in fact uh, human rights had uh, very contested meanings. Uh, human rights took on different kinds of functions, both the language, the practice, human rights law. Uh, and different kind of species or kinds of human rights phenomena had different kinds of genealogies. So, um, again, you can invoke human rights in the abstract. Kind of everyone after the Second World War agrees human rights are a good thing. I mean, the fascists were the, kind of the last people within uh, Western Europe who said would argue against hu hum humanitarianism and human rights. And if human rights meant anything, it was Nazism is bad. But human rights meant a lot of other things. Attaching human rights could be a way of saying the rights of colonized people or women, for example, or different kinds of racial minorities. It could be social rights. People say human rights because they're not just referring to kind of civil and political rights. They're also talking about the right to health care and social security, the right to employment. Um, but the way in which these universal languages of rights were understood is often, you know, traditionally, they don't actually apply to all humans, right? I mean, the American Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. The French Revolution talks about the rights of man. I mean, you could go on and on and on. And, and just because people say everyone enjoys certain rights doesn't actually mean those rights will be applied equally uh, around the world. So I think there are different meanings and functions and a lot of differences between particular individuals involved. When, when there's an individual that's at the UN Human Rights Commission or at the Council of Europe who's representing a government, you need to know something about that individual because there are different individuals within governments who have different kinds of trainings and worldviews and understandings uh, and they compete with themselves and they adopt different kinds of positions. It's important to know whether someone was trained in international law or not, so whether they're French or, or whether they're British, whether they uh, have a very classical Republican understanding of law or they're kind of a conservative Catholic who kind of is nostalgic for the day in which there used to be a church, you know, that united everyone. And, and you know, so these, these, these are important. There's differences between countries. There's not just an Anglo-Saxon vision of human rights in international law versus a continental one, for example or a Western kind of non-communist understanding and then an Eastern communist understanding during the Cold War. There's difference within countries and even within uh, socialism or within conservatism or within Christianity, or within Catholicism, a lot of differences. And often there are more similarities between kind of the West and non-West than differences. So a Catholic understanding of human rights in which, uh, hu that, that in which our rights are embedded in our relationship to different communities, whether it's the family, it could be the local community, it could be uh, you know, different as you know, different kind of communities, and, and that rights flow from these obligations uh, may have actually a lot more in common with certain kinds of non-Western ideas than, than say, uh, um, than you might think. So, um, and here I, again, I think that you have to understand there are different species of human rights. So, human rights, foreign policy, human rights, law, and courts, and human rights activism are not necessarily the same thing. There may be more differences than similarities. It's one thing to have a human rights court, right? Something extraordinary like the European Court of Human Rights, where a private individual can petition the court, where it has supranational constraints on parliaments and executives uh, and domestic judiciaries. This is an extraordinary thing. In 1945, Hirsch Lauterpacht, the preeminent 
kind of international legal scholar in Britain, writes a book called the, An International Bill of the Rights of Man. And he says it would be impossible for there to be an international human rights court. He's kind of envisioning the post-war kind of international order. He said it would be impossible because the, the, the British would never go along with it and the French would never go along and, and, the Western, and the Europeans wouldn't go along because in Europe you just don't have this idea of judicial power. Europeans aren't going to create some kind of US style court. They don't want to give judges this kind of power. Right? And who is it that creates the court? It's the Western Europeans. Well, you got to figure that out. Why, why is that? Uh, I would argue because conservatives traditionally believe in judicial power and, and that, that's kind of part of the story. But you have to understand that, that, that this idea of that you have a kind of individual who then can make claims against the state at some kind of court or commission is a very different idea than, say, Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch. There you don't have individuals kind of petitioning these bodies and kind of being these active kind of rights-bearing subjects in this legal sense or kind of these binding kind of constraints on state behavior. Instead, you have these transnational organizations that really their job is protecting people from human rights abuses, prisoners of conscience. By the way, the, the founder of Amnesty International was a Catholic um, who has many similarities to these ideas. And the whole that whole word, prisoners of conscience, is, has an interesting genealogy. But the Amnesty International is ultimately a kind of transnational organization about protection. It actually has perhaps a lot more in common with humanitarianism, which is humanitarianism is, is often understood as, as regarding um, protection than it does. Oh, I see that clock is wrong. Okay. Okay. So uh, good. I'll wrap up then. I've been looking at that the whole time. Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll, see, I'll see. I was wondering why there was a little nervousness. Okay. So I've been looking at the wrong clock. Okay. So um, so so th th that has different things. And here, you know, there are different. As philosophers have said, there are different categories of uh, rights. The rights can be immunities. They can protect you from, say, the state or someone else. They can be freedoms that empower you. They can make claims for certain kinds of social goods. There can be alternatives to the language of rights. Social and economic rights are often articulated in terms of the common good, for example, in Britain, not in terms of rights. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll just wrap up um, here. I've, I've kind of mentioned these, uh, these different things. I'll, I'll, mention, I'll just wrap up by just gesturing to the interdisciplinary dimensions and just say uh, that I think the challenge of interdisciplinarity, that historians often complain that they, they kind of destroy this myth that everyone shares everywhere else in the in the world, but then no one really pays attention to the fact they destroyed the myth and they go along with the myth. But because it's but it's our job as historians to show the relevance really of what we do and kind of not just to kind of demand that other people read history, but actually kind of read the work and dialogue with others. But this kind of you know leads to a number of problems, both kind of very practical about the way our professions work. You know how we're supposed to kind of frame our work, how we get a promotion, how we sell books, right? Uh, how we get grants, um, and and kind of the, the difficulties of doing of doing that, uh, and they get into also a complication with presentism because anytime you try to appeal as a historian to kind of the present day implications, you can be accused, in fact, of distorting your understanding of the past. So I'll I'll leave it there with you. Sorry for going a bit over, but um, I, I I kept on thinking perpetually it was 11:26 for some reason. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. I'm sure there are questions. So, um, who has questions for Marco? Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, well, actually, I have two questions, but one of them is not really important. I might postpone it to the end of the discussion, maybe even drop it. So, the more important one is uh, I wonder when did the conservatives actually embrace the idea of human rights I mean became more enthusiastic about that because uh, as I perceive as far as I know maybe I am ignorant in this respect the tradition for talking about traditional conservatives like post French revolution conservatives though the throne and altar conservatives they were not very human rights minded they were more rights and duties social cohesion minded and for example the uh, the good example probably would be the French, uh, the Termidorian, after the Termidorian coup, after the Austin of the uh, Jacobian regime. In 1795 there was a new constitution, a new third uh, reduction of the Declaration of Human Rights, but this time it was the Declaration of Human Rights and Duties. So obviously the stress was now both on rights and duties, so this social cohesion. 
So I wonder where did when and the Termidorian uh, coup was obviously like relatively conservative, uh, especially if we're talking in comparison with Chicobians. So I wonder when they actually start to embrace this uh, principle idea of human rights more enthusiastically. Could it be that people who used to be liberals in the 19th century became conservatives in the 20th century and that's how they became the human rights advocates? So, yeah. Okay, so I, I think there, this is a great question. A couple kind of sides to that. One is the question about rights and duties. And the other is the question of, the, you know, when do conservatives become interested in human rights and does the understanding of what is conservatism change? So uh, rights and duties, of course, that relationship is an ancient one. Uh, you know, it's often, I mean, the conventional wisdom is long before a notion of kind of individual rights. There are these different understandings of obligation and duty. But, you know, if you think about liberalism, I mean, liberalism classically is understood as, uh, uh, um, as also un believing there's a nexus between rights and duties. Your duties as an individual citizen or an individual residing on a particular territory derive from your fulfilling certain obligations you have to the state, primarily. So... Um, well, I would, sorry, I, yeah. would, I would disagree. The classical liberalism is all about the borders. My freedom ends when your freedom starts, so that there are invisible borders between us, so actually liberties are primary and the obligations are secondary, obligation not to encroach upon through that invisible wall of your liberty. Isn't it what... Well, maybe that's a kind of Marx, I mean, that would be Marxist, I guess, critique <laughs> of, in the, on the Jewish question okay. is, you know, liberalism or the rights of man, you know, it's a very egoistic kind of uh, ideology in which it just kind of pits the individual against the kind of the community or the collectivity. But uh, if you look at any of the, I mean, look at the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and any of these understandings of rights all come from a respect for the law uh, and, and the rule of law or, or, you know, certain obligations you have as a citizen. Uh, and by the way, you know, again, your obligation to the respect the rights of others, including, you know, property rights and other and other kinds of rights. So, or, or your obligation to serve uh, in the military or take on other kinds of public functions. Though, you know, but as lawyers, you, I mean, I assume you all have an understanding of the law as the rights of individuals within law is contingent upon certain obligations. There are limitations on rights. Now. We may even today, most human rights are not completely inalienable. They are based on duties. Within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there's an article on duties and obligations to the community. So that is, you know, th th this oblig this notion of duty. Now, you may have a kind of hyper individualist kind of rights talk, you know, that's developed, say, particularly, I would say, in recent decades. You might see in the United States, in particular, and other places, in which it's all just about my rights, my rights, my rights, and no obligations. I mean, that tends to be. I mean, people will always say I have rights, and they don't want to have the obligations. But I mean, that's that's interesting. Uh, but I, I guess I'm just kind of generalizing, saying, you know, within different families, you have different understandings of the connection between rights and duties. Socialism has its own understanding. Uh, and again, there are many variants of liberalism and socialism, but if you look, say, at a lot of the more socialist-inspired rights texts and constitutions, uh, your, your, your rights flow from your obligation, say, to perform productive labor and contribute uh, to the community in that sense. A Catholic understanding of rights and duties is often not about the direct relationship between the individual and the state, but that relationship between the individual state is, mo is mediated by the different kinds of communities you find yourself in. Uh, again, whether the family or some kind of civil Catholic civil society uh, or the church or regions or localities or whatever it may be. So there is an understanding there. I mean, that, that and, and under international law, of course, the rights of nations are connected to the obligations of nations. I mean, the whole I mean, positive, legal positivism and the law of nations far for centuries is based on an idea that there is a kind of community of peoples, whether they're called civilized or whatever, the international community in which people have common practices and respect those practices. And so people gain kind of rights in war or as sovereign states in relation to fulfilling these obligations towards one another, whether they're contractual. I mean, liberalism is based on a contractualism as well. You, have, you enter into contracts, whether it's a social contract, contract with individuals, and those contracts involve rights uh, and obligations. Okay, having said that, there's a much more specific question about what happens to duties and what happens to conservatism. I, I don't want to take up all the time, but just to say, I discussed that in my book, and it's interesting why duties kind of fall off. I think there are a number of reasons. 
uh, why they do, and they become kind of inconvenient for, for a number of reasons, whether it's something simple like at the Nuremberg trial, the Nazis constantly invoke their duty, <laughs> or uh, whether it's in fact that this idea of duties can uh, gain a certain understanding of rights that is, that is not uh, friendly to the people involved. So, I'm um, just picking up on that last point because I mean, as we understand human rights, right? There is, they are, as uh, in legal terms, non-related to duties at all. There is, under because human rights are um, inalienable, there is nothing that you can do that would cause you to lose your human rights. For example, so um, which is now coming back. So duties are coming back, right? It's related to uh, fears of global terrorism, for example, and we see that in discussions about nationality, right? So if you go and fight abroad for uh, whoever, actually. I mean, at, at least in the UK, whether you fight on the side of the Kurds or on the side of um, uh, uh, ISIS, you can lose certain rights upon your return, the right to re-enter the United Kingdom, nationality rights and so on, based on your human. But th those are sort of nationality rights, but human rights should be outside of that. That's what makes them human as opposed to rights in general. Right? So that's at least how we've always understood it in law. But um, actually, my question was to, you've been talking about international human rights law. And this is a global law lab. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a real difference between global law and international law, um, at least as we teach it in this law school. And so um, I would like to push you a little bit on the claims about global human rights, you know, based on all that you've been telling us about um, context. Right? How would you then uh, view the kind of claims about human rights made in global administrative law or global constitutions? Of course, the claim that these rights are indeed global as opposed to international? Okay, um, so I, I, this, they're great questions and um, part of them just falls outside of the scope of my knowledge and expertise and something I need to follow up on, which is why they're great questions. But I would just say that, so from, uh, well, I mean, I, I first of all, I should say, okay, I guess you have this reference point to what international law is. I guess there is, I mean, I guess we have to accept the assumption there is some kind of global understanding of what international or global human rights law is in 2017 and maybe some years before that. But well, there is, I mean, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of course, and all the other rights, major rights texts that preceded it, there's references to some form of obligation. The European Convention on Human Rights has a huge range of limitations for most of the rights. You can derogate on the rights. Same with all the international covenants. So obviously there are some rights considered inalienable, like for example, not to be tortured. Um, I would just, I mean, and, and maybe again, this is not my lack of a kind of literacy as a, as, a, as, a, as a lawyer, in fact, but my understanding is if you put limitations on rights or you have the ability not to implement a human rights text equally and universally across all your territories or to differentiate between citizens and non-citizens, then that involves explicitly or implicitly some understanding of an obligation you have. Is that, would that rights, be correct? Human rights are not limited to citizens, right? They're applied to territories. So you, there's no citizenship obligation, certainly under the European Convention on Human Rights. If you're in the Netherlands, we're both foreigners here. <coughs> the Dutch state has the same obligation to protect our human rights as any Dutch national. So there's no obligation of citizenship. And I think you're looking at limitations slightly. Yeah, so yes, there are limitations. Of course, there are always limitations um, to accept to a very few rights, such as torture <coughs> or genocide and so on, uh, prohibition on genocide. But those limitations, for example, take the right to life. If you're in the middle of a riot, right, the state can kill you, right? Or attempting to arrest you, the state within reason can kill you in attempting to arrest you. But there are different aspects of the right to life. So no matter how you have been killed or what you were doing that might have justified your death, they're under the same obligation to investigate your death in, in equally impartial ways, right? So for example, um, the McCann case. Yeah, but that's the. I mean, that's a basic that's principle. Limited, of, but that's, but that's a basic principle of state. liberalism, right? That you have to have Balance. rule of law and apply yeah. but it's the law equally, both to, to an understanding of rights and obligation. I mean, first of all, the European Convention allows you to apply it uh, not equally on overseas territories. It allows for uh, non. It puts rights on the political restrictions on the political activity of aliens. So there are some distinctions there. But you're right. In general, it's not about citizens and non-citizens, though I would argue is envisioned as such and has primarily been applied as such in practice. I guess I just, I don't quite, again, maybe it's just my lack of kind of, again, the fluency in, in exactly the terminology you use nowadays, um, because again, my reference point is back in the first half of the 20th century. Um, but 
uh, I, I just assume that the that the limitation, the many, many, many limitations that are put on on rights within when rights are actually protected supranationally effectively uh, falls back on uh, implicitly on an understanding that you have obligations. So when the European Convention on Human Rights or the Covenant talks about the important, you know, that you can limit rights and if there's a threat to health or public order or safety and things like that, that there's a certain implicit notion of that. But I, I again, I think I, it falls back on state sovereignty. It doesn't okay. fall back on the idea of duties. Right? So okay. it, it falls back on the margin of appreciation, the idea that states get freedom, <coughs> a, a margin of appreciation in which to fulfill the rights in the convention. And right? what and is what is, of, what is the basis of what is the what is the basis of legitimacy of that though? Of state sovereignty? Of margin of appreciation. Of state sovereignty, I would argue. Rather than <coughs> rather than the duties that the individual owes in order to get their rights. And that's for, at least for a lawyer, that's a very strange way of looking at the European okay. uh, human so, rights and the European. So that's convention. that's interesting and it's interesting that I guess I would argue that's interesting that the way in which international legal reasoning and has, has kind of evolved away from, say, the earlier understanding that it was grounded in, in some conception of kind of rights and obligations and the common good, maybe more generally. Uh, the common good being very important. It's not just about kind of rights. Um, so, you know, and within the Universal Declaration, there's a reference to duties, but maybe that doesn't matter to international lawyers. Maybe. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So I would just say, I mean, for the people who, I, who are charged with kind of... Uh, shaping the contents of a lot of these documents, the rights and the limitations and the institutional structure, they have an understanding. But it's interesting, again, that they don't say it's a declaration of rights and duties. And that's itself interesting, right? And that's so why, I mean, I think you're correct in that sense. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's good. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting point for me to reflect on. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for this fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, so it, I'm going back a bit to the beginning of the presentation. Um, I mean, more or less the main thesis of your, of your book I find uh, fascinating and also fascinating given the moment in which it's being published today, uh, this, this year, um, given that the most kind of reactive uh, political currents to the European Court of Human Rights in Europe today are precisely national splits of conservative parties that we see in the UK, mm -hmm. all throughout Scandinavia, uh, and Switzerland, and other places. Um, so I was wondering how you read those together. Also because, of, so I, I'm not a, I'm not a historian of training by any means, but if I go back and look at um, at jurisprudence from from the UK, from the appellate courts, it's precisely the conservative judges on the appellate courts who have very dismissive attitudes towards the European Convention of Human Rights. At times it almost seems like they would prefer to come to the conclusion that the convention requires them to come to uh, through using only uh, common law instruments and avoiding any kind of recognition of the legitimacy of the, of the European Convention. This is all before the Human Rights Act in the UK, of course, which, which really clarified the, the um, importance of the Convention in the UK. But um, I, I find it fascinating that on the one hand we see, if we look further back, this kind of political support among conservative parties and statesmen, while on the other hand, conservative jurists, conservative politicians today see this as a, a direct competing factor with the sovereignty of their nationalist political agenda. So I'm wondering, is, does sovereignty just not come into play in this earlier uh, historical period in the, in the support for the human rights in these, in these streams? Mm, okay, so I, yeah, I think there's a couple of great questions. I think, I mean, one is about looking at the present day context in terms of conservative and conservative positions, and particularly with regard to the British. Uh, and then there's this last uh, point you just made about sovereignty, which I guess relates yeah. to the previous question as well. And, and actually, I think this relates to the first set of questions about does conservatism change? So we can't essentialize conservatism. Uh, there are many different forms of conservatism within any given country, many within conservative parties. Depending on the degree of party discipline and other factors, there are splits and, and differences. And a lot of political systems throughout history and parliamentary systems, there are actually sometimes more similarities uh, with, with a politician of one party and another party there are, than there are within a party on a lot of issues. Conservatism itself, uh, so within Britain, you you know you could make different kinds of categories. There is a kind of set of British conservatism that, uh, over the course of the beginning of the 20th century, essentially are conservatives who think of themselves as kind of 19th century liberals, an anti-statist kind of more libertarian, you might call it, form of conservatism, a form of conservatism in Britain that thinks the Liberal Party has in fact abandoned its own principles as the Liberal Party shifts to the left. A lot of people had been in the Liberal Party, or been in the Liberal, such as Churchill, for example, shift over to conservatism after the Bolshevik Revolution, the rise of socialism, 
uh, the New Deal even is something they don't like. Uh, this kind of fear of statism, right? Particularly exacerbated by the First World War and then the Second World War in which the state accrues a huge amount of emergency powers, it scares them. Um, so there's that kind of conservatism. And there, there's also, there are a lot of other variants and they, which all can kind of be combined. I mean, that itself is not just about statism. It's also that conservatism can coexist with an idea that kind of law and values are, are bound to a kind of older Christian civilization or kind of older kinds of values. It can coexist with a kind of Burkean idea of the importance of kind of tradition and custom and a kind of organicism in which societies evolve kind of like an organism over time. You shouldn't have dramatic kind of revolutionary change, right? Uh, it can coexist with a certain critique of liberal individualism. And there are lots of different variants. I think today, what, if you look at the Conservative Party manifesto in their most recent election, there's a rejection of both libertarianism and socialism. And it actually says within the manifesto that uh, individuals don't just have rights, but obligations to the nation and community. So in a way, I'm going to kind of agree with the, with the previous line to say uh, that, yes, talk of obligations in this context and talk and an attack on libertarianism is, in a, is also an attack on this kind of liberal individualist kind of 19th century classical liberalism, which also then kind of takes the form of neoliberalism later. Um, and, it's, and I see that it, it's often applauded by the left as, oh, this is great. It's, it's against Thatcherism. It's against neoliberalism. But in a way, it provides a backdoor for an attack on human rights by attacking the libertarian strain of conservatism, right? Um, okay, so within the present, yes, present day context, of course, the right wing uh, press and a lot of conservatives and, and people more on the right, the Eurosceptics attack the European Court of Human Rights. They don't like the Human Rights Act to varying degrees. They may want to leave the court altogether. And there's a general origin story that they tell about original intent, which they say, first of all, the convention was a kind of British invention and reflects British values and British common law. In the same way, by the way, that during the Nuremberg trials after the war, uh, the British said, oh, well, the Nuremberg trials are reflecting British principles of common law. There was actually a lot of enthusiasm for them. Um, it wasn't about international law, by the way. It was about British principles of common law. But at the same time as kind of the British gave this gift to the Continentals in a kind of way civilizing the Continentals. And there's a lot of that in my book about this idea that you're kind of civilizing Europe after Europe itself has become kind of barbaric. Um, at the same time, then they say, oh, but there's these foreign judges that are applying the convention in a way that was never intended. The, the British were never intended to, Britain was never intended even to be subject to the court, which isn't true. As I show in my book, the conservatives, you know, Churchill and David Maxwell Fife were incredibly concerned. David Maxwell Fife, in, all, in a lot of drafts of the convention, uh, says very much like we need a human rights act. That the main that this this will be a kind of U.S. style Supreme Court, but the main implementation of it will reside in British courts, and they have to be given a lot more judicial power and powers of judicial review than they have at present. Uh, so, and the French Catholics have their own kind of story there, and their own problems with kind of parliamentary supremacy. So that part, they say it's not as applied to Britain, and it was an anti-totalitarian instrument. So it was basically a response to fascism in the Second World War and then communism. But with fascism and communism receding, why do we even need this? It's an anachronism. So there, that's kind of the argument. And by the way, parts of that are true. From the British perspective, yeah, a lot of them did think it was their gift to the continent. Um, it was anti-totalitarian. It was constructed against fascism and communism. By the way, that's not just a conservative position to be scared of communism and fascism, of course, right? Uh, just like it's not a conservative position necessarily to be in favor of a lot of civil liberties and things. Um, so it's not just a conservative document, right? But, but um, what uh, I would argue is that totalitarianism in the context of the 30s and 40s uh, and 50s is not just limited to communism and fascism for many people. Many people see democratic socialism as totalitarian or having a totalitarian potential. They see kind of these civil servants and technocrats, as they would call them, as accruing more and more power to the state and the executive diminishing constraints. They see that there's a totalitarian potential within democracy itself and within majority rule. That, and that's what they blame the rise of fascism on, for example, and kind of demagogic populist movements. So my argument is just is that the that the convention was intended to constrain parliamentary majorities and British parliamentary majorities that the, 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 the that the framers would never have talked about the will of the people as being the supreme thing at all and the and the idea now that you have this you have a populist right wing attacks on judicial power that you see not just in Britain you see it in Australia you see it in the U S you see it in the continent as well and that would have been anathema to the conservatives it doesn't mean the conservatives in my book don't share a lot with the, with the present say Theresa May and the present these other conservatives. But they, they also would not have agreed with that, with that position. 
um, Lawrence of Hess from Kent University. I have a question. Uh, your book is absolutely fascinating. Uh, and it's great that you bring to the fore, uh, to the fore I guess, history of, of this conservative involved in drafting the European Convention on Human Rights, which, which has been downplay, uh, downplayed. But I was wondering whether by uh, like amplifying this uh, forgotten history, but you're not at the same time also downplaying involvement of social democrats in the in the in in the drafting of the convention. Because if I look at my country, Belgium, then the people involved in the drafting process, the like the there were mainly like internationalists belonging to the Socialist Party, uh, uh, like Fernand de Vos, Henri Rollet. Um, so um, I mean, I was wondering, I mean. What was their agenda, and is it not like mm -hmm. too too much? Isn't it like too much downplayed in your book to some extent? Sure. Okay. So let me just preface this by saying, and again, to the global aspects. <laughs> okay. So I make a sharp a distinction in my book. Right. I say, you know, the global human rights project is definitely related to the European one. In you know, there's synergy, but they're also parallel and conflicting, and there are a different set of actors. One more led by states one not so much and a different kind of cast of characters at the UN Human Rights Commission. Now, socialists play a very important role at the UN, including De Hoos, uh, including Latin American socialists, uh, left of center people more generally. Rene Cassin, the French delegate, is not a socialist, but he is, broadly speaking, agrees with kind of social democracy. He doesn't believe in the same kind of powers of the state, probably, that the, that the, that the Socialist Party did, but he is. He, and, and he believes, you know, they, they, they all, most of them believe in a wide range of economic, social, cultural rights. Communists play an important role. Uh, uh, both because the 1936 Soviet Constitution is an important model for the Universal Declaration. It's also a model for, say, post-war constitutions in, in Italy and France, for example. So, and communists are at the forefront of protecting the rights of colonized people, the rights of workers, right? So all these different political families play a role, but if we just get very specifically to the European Convention on Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So let's take Fernand de Hoos. Mm -hmm. uh, he is involved kind of uh, moment, momentarily in February 1949 at a particular a uh, meeting in Brussels, which is a very important meeting and, and, and an interesting one that I go into depth in, in my book, but he be, he's the chair of this committee that's tasked with, the, with kind of discussing a European Convention on Human Rights. But what's interesting about that, first of all, uh, is that he is, kind of, well, first of all, he actually, he's, because he's the chair, he doesn't actually have, uh, he only exercises his vote once, but that's fine. Um, he's attacked by uh, then and afterwards as being anti-clerical. He's kind of pilloried by the Christians because they say he's pursuing an anti-clerical uh, agenda. Interesting, the Catholic Church is represented there when it comes to certain kinds of issues of the rights of the family and, and church schools uh, and kind of and, and other issues like that. Um, after, so then the other thing you have to understand is just because someone's listed as attending a meeting or even listed on a report, first of all, it doesn't mean they always attended the meeting. Got to check, <laughs> or they contributed to the report. But you also you have to kind of measure the impact. So Fernand de Hoos, uh, afterwards. Uh, he is invited to participate. He, he's, he's not given the chairmanship of the commission that finally comes up with the European movement draft. That's given to a Christian Democrat, to Jean. Uh, we can, it's an interesting figure too. But, but basically, what he, because he's so consumed with the socialist politics at home in Belgium, he largely absents himself. Same with, with uh, Jean Drapier, another Belgian socialist, does the same thing. Uh, and then finally, when he becomes involved at the end uh, and kind of discussing with Pierre-Henri Tijen, he concedes a lot, basically kind of everything to Pierre-Henri Tijen that he wanted, I think in part because of, of the, you know, the, there's a number of different factors, in part because he allows for a lot of controversial rights, like the rights of, uh, regarding kind of parental rights and church schools and property rights and things, because I, I think both he's occupied with something else and also he's been kind of cowed, he's been kind of bullied so much by these conservatives. And then he kind of drops out. Henri Roland is against uh, having a European Court of Human Rights in the beginning, which is the kind of the typical socialist position at the time. They don't want a court. The court is not something the left traditionally likes. The courts are conservative institutions. Uh, they're, 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 the, the, the judiciary is a conservative caste. You know, courts are usually. I mean, associated with repressing left-wing organizations and property rights and all kinds of things. So they're not terribly enthusiastic about courts, basically. Um, so Roland initially opposes it in 1949. Then, but he interestingly, he wants economic and social rights to be protected. They don't get protected. Um, and then he kind of comes back in in 1950 and is more supportive and eventually plays an important role in the 50s. But what, what I guess I'm just saying here, the larger point is you have to look very particular uh, at the kind of individual contributions of these individuals. It's not to dismiss their importance. It's just to say we need to be carefully go. So we need to go in, in, in a lot of sources beyond the kind of official publications. And of course, every country and every political group wants to kind of claim some ownership over whatever text, and that's fine. 
Uh, I mean, you see that a lot with kind of socialists and left-wing types with the European project more generally. You know? talk about these early kind of left-wing federalists. But you have to actually look how important were they at that particular kind of moment. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Any more questions? Uh, if not, okay. Oh, just one last question. Sure. Could you explain how exactly uh, uh, looking at the spaces, at the palaces where the court sits, that the symbolism of their architecture can help us? Well, I'd say read the book, uh, because I do try to show the causality. I mean, you know, so the, you know, the book is 300,000 words. I mean, one thing we do as historians is, you know, you really need to plunge into the context, you know, to hack the thing. But I try to show causality. So, you know, Churchill cites romantic poetry at the Congress of Europe in the context of his internationalism. So all the romantic dimension, the cultural dimensions I talk about in the book with the peace palace, the Christian and humanist virtues, this romantic imagination, it's very explicit. David Maxwell Fife was probably the leading, the most influential drafter of the European Convention on Human Rights at Nuremberg, cites Rupert Brooke, this neo-romantic poet's sonnet, The Soldier, which he drafted in the First World War, he talks about the fallen British soldiers kind of spiritually, the dead British soldiers spiritually returning to Britain in the countryside in this very romantic kind of utopian vision. And he says, this is the basis of my vision of international justice. And when he goes in front of other associations of lawyers like the Grotius Society, he says very explicitly, this poem and my faith, and I'm a romantic, and I have this faith as a lawyer, that this is at the basis of my of the European Convention on Human Rights and so forth. So if you have, I mean, you don't always get that. That was lucky that I found that. But I, I think um, th there is direct causality. All the Christian and humanist dimensions are there, are there throughout in the transcripts. Uh, themselves, but even if they weren't, I think, and, and even if you believe that, that international law should be objective, which an objective science, which sure it should be, it's important to understand how the way in which you, you think about international law, you reason, and the way in which these documents uh, originate are culturally kind of conditioned by certain kinds of sensibilities and other, and, and, and the way people are brought up and, and, and other things. And if you want to make it an objective science, that's great, but be then self-aware and understand how the the, these, the, what you do is culturally contingent, whether explicit or not, and then maybe you're better able to, to, if you want, to kind of extract yourself from that cultural particularity. But you know, you you know, you ha you have to kind of, you know, you have to actually kind of, you know, take the leap of, of faith yourself and, and and actually look into the culture, and then you can make your own determination. You know, but that is not just about what's in a history book or academic book. That's a broader awareness of your discipline and yourself as being not just the kind of you know, mind detached from the culture you're in, but shaped by everything around you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll round off to you, so let's have another final round of applause. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, okay. I have no, whatever.